let me begin. Um, the title is paradoxical for a good reason, because I'm going to suggest a sort of par paradoxical way to talk about biological information and how it's become complex over the course of evolution. And it will, as you'll see by the time I finish this, um, the phrase falling up actually captures what I'm after, because I want to argue that in fact, uh, complexity of information processes in living systems uh, happens spontaneously. It's not the result of natural selection um, or other processes that we might think of as biological work. So let me begin this way. Brains are the epitome of biological complexity and information processing. To fully understand the nature of a complex system like the brain and the kind of information processing it does, it's not always sufficient just to describe how it's organized and functions. Often important insights can be provided by exploring how a complex organization like that arose. It's particularly informative when we, will when we discover that our assumptions about this process and how it works might be wrong. I think that this is the case for the evolution of biological complexity and biological information processing, including in fact, also the evolution of human mental abilities. In this talk, I will outline the evidence for a paradoxical inversion of natural selection logic that explains the tendency for evolution to exhibit hierarchic increases in synergistic complexity. This process is not an alternative to natural selection. However, it's rather a kind of positive complement to natural selection's eliminative logic. The biology is not merely a physical or chemical science. It's fundamentally a science of information. Its most basic molecular processes are all organized to record and inform and are highly improbable thermodynamically. Over the course of evolution, one of the most robust and ubiquitous trends has been an increase in informational complexity, particularly hierarchic complexity. And yet natural selection has no intrinsic directionality except towards increasing effectiveness at capturing resources and increasing efficiency in their utilization. So what is the process that incessantly tends towards increased hierarchical complexity of living information? Living organisms are currently the most complex systems we encounter. The common sense conception of evolution is that it's a process, of, a process that's progressive and that the theory of natural selection provides a sufficient explanation of how biological complexity arose. But in many respects, natural selection should be expected to exhibit the evolution of um, simplicity. This is because natural selection tends to favor more efficient and more effective mechanisms, and it weeds out less efficient and degraded mechanisms. It does not favor increased complexity unless this correlates with increased fitness. A Rube Goldberg apparatus for sharpening a pencil is more complex than a hand pencil sharpener, but it will never replace its simpler counterpart. Stephen Jay Gould offered a kind of non-Darwinian account of the apparent directionality of evolution when he pointed out that life couldn't get much simpler than the simplest creatures alive today, shown here as kind of left wall, but that there's always room to wander into more complex possibilities, even if by random chance. But there are constraints on complexity. Biological complexity necess necessarily is confounded with size. This is because there are limits on the size of macromolecules, limits on the size of simple cells, limits on the size of cells that contain smaller cellular compartments, limits on the size of multicellular organisms, and limits on the size of synergistically functioning social groups. As a result, in order to take advantage of possibilities that are only available at larger size, life has hit upon a kind of Russian dolls strategy where interdependence of parts can create larger synergistic holes that can in turn become interdependent parts within yet even larger holes. Organic information processes exhibit a hierarchically nested logic Although global organism function is regulated by top-down information processes, 
These entirely depend on largely autonomously operating processes at lower molecular levels. Evolution proceeds bottom up in contrast. The smaller holes come together to form larger holes, but in the process, they become subsumed, losing the autonomy they once had. But with increasing hierarchic complexity comes the need for ever more complex information processes. Evolutionary transitions between levels of biological complexity became a major topic of discussion beginning in the 1990s. And they were highlighted as major transitions in evolution. Each transition was explained in terms of ever higher levels of cooperation between lower level productive, reproductive units. And it was mostly framed within a standard neo-Darwinian framework focused on improved adaptive efficiency and improved informational control at ever higher levels. So those I've marked here in red, the transition from prokaryotics to eukaryotics, from protists to animals, plants, and fungi, um, and from eusocial, from solitary individuals to eusocial individuals, and of course, human evolution and the origins of language. I'll be talking about it as we move along here. This followed decades of argument that produce a series of hypothetical mechanisms to explain what sorts of extrinsic factors might select for cooperation. Although each of the mechanisms shown here that were evoked to explain the emergence of cooperation probably have played some role in the, initi in the initiation of increased complexity, they tend to ignore how these conditions initially arise. And this fails to notice a potent intrinsic factor that tends to allow complex interdependency to develop spontaneously and a process that prevents reversion once this has become established. The intrinsic factor that I'm talking about is the spontaneous generation of acquired codependency. It's a critical complement to those many extrinsic factors that are shown here that underlie the tendency for synergistic complexity to spontaneously increase in evolution. Although the extreme of cooperation is found among the cells of multifold plant and animal bodies, the examples of eusocial insect colonies, sometimes described as superorganisms, is often invoked to compare to the much larger human cooperative groups from communities to nation states. On the top left, I show bulldog ant workers who feed their own eggs to their larvae. On the bottom left, honey pot ant workers who become food storage vessels. In other words, sacrificing themselves for the whole. On the right, termites exhibit incredibly diverse body forms, including the single huge breeding queen with her abdomen swollen here with eggs and surrounded by dozens of worker attendants that are required to move her from place to place to feed her, to help deliver her eggs, and so on. Understanding how these many members of these complex colonies have evolved to become irreversibly codependent and the information that they share in order to accomplish their synergistic functioning um, is what's proposed a complexity paradox in the course of evolutionary theory. In summary, the paradox of higher order complexity is that evolution appears to have solved something that should be impossible. The evolution of synergistic complexity requires that lower level mechanisms have to give up functional autonomy. This is the case with ants and bees, for example. This is also uh, because independent expression of lower level autonomous functions tends to compete with the synergistic functioning of the larger collective system. But only a small subset of lower level functions are ever collectively useful. The rest are expendable, redundant baggage. But sacrificing functional autonomy is what risks extinction. Only autonomy ensures preservation. This need to preserve autonomy creates a high threshold. It tends to block the development of irreversible higher order complexity. So how can this threshold be re reduced? The other problem for theories attempting to explain the evolution of stable and thoroughly integrated multi celled bodies is accounting for the ways that they prevent the destructive reemergence then of lower level autonomy. In the 1990s, Leo Buss argued 
that the three most successful multicellular groups, fungi, vascular plants, and animals, took advantage of three slightly different ratchet-like mechanisms to prevent this sort of backsliding. They were cell permeability in fungi, cell immobility in plants, and maternal control of initial cell fates in animals. These mechanisms each prevented individual cells from being able to control their eventual fates in the organism. This is a kind of biological analog to John Rawls' notion of a veil of ignorance. It guarantees a fair distribution of opportunities within a group. <clears throat> Two general mechanisms have been suggested to explain how intrinsic processes might contribute to the evolution of higher order complexity. Maynard Smith and Zaff Murray produced a process that they called contingent irreversibility. Contingent irreversibility is a ratchet-like mechanism that prevents degradation of functional dependencies that have formed for accidental reasons that may have little to do with the selective forces um, that are surrounding them and brought them into existence. But under these circumstances, exact reversal is oftentimes improbable. For example, genetic mutations that degrade a function have a higher probability of being compensated for by other modulatory influences and being compensated by reinstating the exactly reversed mutations. But the presence of modulatory mechanisms means that purifying selection becomes relaxed and the effects of drift in relaxed selection can become even more significant. This will be the driver of what I wanna talk about next. A related concept, conceptual development to talk about this at the level of molecular biology has been called contingent neutral evolution. The authors of this concept described it in this way. Although complexity in biology is generally regarded as evidence of fine tuning or sophistication, large bio biological conglomerates of molecules might better be interpreted as the consequences of a kind of runaway bureaucracy. As biological parallels of nonsensically complex Rube Goldberg machines that are over-engineered to perform a single task. And also that cellular functions will be inevitably come to depend on the interaction of more and more components. That is, functions will tend to diffuse as a consequence of the inevitable gratuitous pre-existence of potentially suppressive molecular interactions. This suggests a kind of spontaneous evolution of complexity. And what follows, I'll focus on a related regressive tendency to explain how such a ratchet-like mechanism might evolve. A colleague has suggested that I call this mechanism the lazy gene effect, because it exemplifies the sort of least work principle in biology. And it's something I'll be focused on throughout the rest of this talk. To limit the intrinsic load on genomic information, natural selection tends to take advantage of intrinsically available constraints and predictable processes. This is exemplified by spiral phylotaxis in plants, shown here on the left two images. This produces mathematically precise Fibonacci relationships, and yet this information is not maintained in the genome as a mathematical relationship. Recognizing that these patterns can also be generated by simple geometric forces, shown here in the right panel due to electrostatic repulsive forces, provides a clue. It's because this pattern can develop by a kind of self-organization if appropriate conditions are established. Genetic information produces this effect by regulating molecular diffusion and cell growth tendencies that are at the boundary conditions for this pattern to spontaneously form. The first example of this sort of logic was suggested by the evolutionary geneticist Susumu Ono in his 1970 book, The Evolution by Gene Duplication. And in the years since, it has been developed into a detailed theory for explaining um, the surprising complexity of many so-called molecular machines in the cell, such as ribosomes and spliceosomes. His work led to the formulation of a multi-step evolutionary process, beginning with gene duplication, followed by relaxed selection on the redundant duplicate and degeneration of its structure and combinatorial shuffling of duplicates by sexual recombination, and finally hitting upon 
complementary interactions between their now fractionated functions. And what follows, I'll try to give an example of this. In his 1977 book, uh, his 1970 book, he proposed the following example. He compared whole genome sizes and examples of polyploidy. For example, wheat is hexaploid, that is it has six of each chromosome. He argued that both whole gene duplication as well as individual gene duplication can occur in evolution. He predicted that there were two major genome events in which whole genomes duplicated, for example, in the animal lineage. It turns out that in fact, in the animal lineage, not only were there whole duplications of the genome, but in fact, in teleos fishes, uh, there was yet another duplication event. So that in some senses, um, there were six different copies of every gene. Gene duplication is now known to be one of the most common and widespread mutational processes in evolution. Genes can be duplicated by uneven crossing over during meiosis, by transposons, by viral effects, and so on. Duplicates are initially redundant. This relaxes selection on one copy, allowing the other copy to accumulate mutations without any significant selective consequence. The mutations can involve changes in coding regions, that produce protein functional differences, as shown here, but also changes in promoter regions that simply alter gene regulation. And of course, both can occur. Regulatory changes that alter where in the body and when in development a gene tends to get expressed are in fact even more likely to have limited negative effects because they don't interact with the initial gene that was the ancestor of both. The effect of gene duplication is depicted here in this highly schematic example, where initially the gene on the left produces a protein. Um, I call it phenotype one, that is the first level of its output. And this protein affects a function depicted as a kind of a bell curve graph at the top. Its selection consequence is diagrammed as a gray arrow curving back down to affect the future preservation or elimination of that gene. On the right, I show a duplication process. After duplication, Selection is maintained for one copy while the redundant copy is allowed to accumulate mutational errors. This is shown by little vertical arrows, little vertical lines in the gene. These are not eliminated because selection on this particular copy is relaxed by the presence of the other functioning gene. This will lead to the evolution of multiple variant functions in different lineages over time shown here uh, by the changes in the bell curves up there at the top of the function. Notice the comparison here with information theory. Redundancy here actually allows something else to happen. Redundancy, when the information carried has a function, redundancy allows that function to degrade and diversify. Synergistic functions can arise between the duplicates if the degeneration in one of these is not an all or none breakdown, but a gradual kind of random walk from an original function. Random recombination of independently degraded duplicates in sexual species increases the possibility of recombining the different variants and eventually encountering one that complements the original function. In this way, novel synergistic effects can emerge and become selectively favored. Here, this is depicted by reciprocal changes in the diagram functions. A well-known example of this involves hemoglobin genes. An original hemoglobin gene was duplicated in early animals to produce separate alpha and beta forms. Over the course of evolution, the non-oxygen binding parts of these two molecules, shown here uh, on the sort of inside of this figure uh, on the right, varied in form due to genetic mutations that had almost no function on their oxygen carrying capacity. But as different forms were recombined eventually by sexual recombination, a combination in which the molecular shapes of the backsides of these molecules fit with each other was encountered. This enabled them to stick together into a four-part molecular complex to form 
a tetramer that could carry more oxygen than any single one alone or any of the four separated. Thus, evolution effectively discovered a new synergistic function. This is depicted here showing that there were many duplications of the hemoglobin gene. Each of these little um, red circles represents a duplication event in the course of evolution. And we can see that on top, they all evolved from a common ancestor with myoglobin, uh, the molecule like hemoglobin in your muscle cells that makes muscle cells look red. Um, hemoglobin normally has alpha and beta chains, but it turns out that the beta chain shown here in green has actually duplicated many more times. Uh, this has an interesting consequence because not only did one duplication produce this capacity where you can carry more oxygen, but the duplication of the beta hemoglobin gene produced something remarkable. Further duplication of the beta hemoglobin gene only occurred in placental mammals. Each variant that's indicated here in the top right um, and is indicated by Greek letters, epsilon, gamma, and delta, acquired a slightly different oxygen binding property. There are two in gray that are what we call pseudogenes that no longer produce a protein product. But this duplication of beta genes enable placental mammal fetuses to adjust their capacity to acquire oxygen from maternal hemoglobin. Because being inside the mother's body, the only way they can get ox oxygen is to have their hemoglobin be able to extract, ex extract oxygen from mother's hemoglobin. But as a result, this made it possible to prolong gestation in placental mammals. This multi-stage duplication, degeneration, and then complementation of function gave rise to a novel synergistic adaptation, the ability for placental birth. This process can be recursive level upon level. For example, regulatory genes produce proteins that bind to the promoters of other genes, shown here as little pluses, and affect their expression. This is shown here at the top left. One well-known class of these genes called Hox genes has been duplicated many times in early animals, each with slight variants producing a family of closely related genes, each varying slightly from one another and contributing to the segmental body morphology of different animals. Now at the very bottom, we see that one gene was duplicated many times in insects. Each one of them now takes on a slightly different function, which means it binds with a slightly different combination of other, other genes and causes a slightly different expression of all of those genes synergistically. But this results in a yet further level of duplication, degeneration, and complementation, that is, of body parts. It results in a complex theme and variation synergy between interacting body parts. This is shown on the right, both in plants and in animals. Analogous to gene duplication now, some functional differentiation and duplication of body structures allows degeneration and synergistic functional relationships to, dis to evolve at the level of whole body parts. You can see also on the bottom left of the duplication of the entire family of Hox genes that occurs in mammals, uh, where we can see, remember the duplication of the entire genome. That's the result that's shown here. And just above that in fish, where you get an additional duplication. Um, as a result, it's now possible for some of these genes to be lost and many of them to take on slightly different functions. We get a very complex um, duplication and degeneration and complementation possibility showing up as a result of this happening, this kind of hierarchical process. But duplication effects can also occur, occur between organisms. This happens in cases of mutualism and symbiosis. It's particularly striking in cases where one organism inhabits another, as in endosymbiosis. In this case, the external duplication of function can produce extreme dependency of the endosymbiont on its host by providing many functions that the endosymbiont no longer needs to produce for itself. The host environment relaxes selection on many of the intrinsic functions, allowing extensive degeneration of the information in the endosymbiont. 
both host and symbiont adapt to each other in this way, and both will suffer complementary degenerative changes. This produces a kind of ratchet effect that prevents returning to a non-symbiotic condition. The symbiotic whole is thus more complex, even though each of the components may have simplified a bit. An example of this can be found in bacterial symbionts found in the guts of aphid species. The bacterium provides the aphid with chemicals that allow it to penetrate into the sugar-rich vessels of the plant. And the aphid's body now provides a specialized storage organ for the bacterium. The circular diagram on the right shows that this bacterium has undergone massive gene loss. That's the inner circle compared to the ancestral gene state that's shown in the outer circle. Gray regions in the outer circle represent regions of lost genes. Massive loss of genes has therefore taken place in the endosymbiont. However, there's both been loss of genes in the endosymbiont and loss of genes for feeding in other ways in the host of the aphid. Both are now dependent on the other. This is the result of a sort of internal arms race between the bacterium and the aphid in which each adapts to an imbalance that's generated by the other as each evolves to maximize its situation. But this results in a kind of spiral of co-adaptations that makes each irreversibly linked to the other, a complex relationship that neither can eventually re reverse, a ratchet effect. Probably the most extensive example of this has been the complex eukaryotic cell in which organelles such as mitochondria and chloroplasts have evolved from once free living bacteria. After colonizing archaean cells, these bacteria lost roughly 98% of their original genes. This codependency is further complicated by gene loss from the transfer to the cell nucleus and from the cell nucleus out into these organelles. The result is obligate codependency, a fractionation and redistribution of information and function. And as a result, increasing complexity of structure and adaptability, even though it's the result of degradation. One further variant on this theme occurs when duplication is provided by something in the external environment. External duplication of function or constraint creates the added complexification that loss of some fraction of organism autonomy requires the development of adaptations to maintain this external environmental source, or at least to maintain access to it. An example that demonstrates how externally induced degenerative effects can produce emergent synergies is demonstrated by our need for dietary ascorbic acid, that is vitamin C. Most mammals synthesize ascorbic acid endogenously, but a few lineages, including anthropoid primates, fruit bats, and many birds, and us, of course, have apparently lost this ability. Monkeys and apes like us must regularly acquire ascorbic acid from their diets typically from eating fruit. The cladogram in the upper left shows the lineages in red that cannot synthesize their own ascorbic acid. This is a slight elaboration of the schematic gene duplication example I showed at the beginning, in which now an extrinsic duplication by some extrinsic factor E, such as the availability of ascorbic acid in fruit, is redundant with a given gene function here shown uh, in F4. This is analogous to gene duplication and influence, but the external origin changes the consequences when the gene degrades. Shown here with a dashed arrow that indicates that there's a lack of purifying selection causing a degradation. This irreversible degradation causes selection to be redistributed and displaced onto all loci that have any partial functional role and helping to maintain the presence of that external resource. Even though none of these were originally evolved, involved, assume that none of these originally evolved for its production. In this way, control of the function is now becoming indirect and redistributed across many different interdependent systems in the organism, making it both more complex and also more metastable. 
1994, a Japanese research group discovered the rat gene here shown called LGO, sometimes called GULO, that produces a protein enzyme that's critical to the endogenous synthesis of ascorbic acid. Subsequently, a human pseudogene for ascorbic acid synthesis was discovered by using the rat gene as a probe for its human homolog. The human gene, however, has accumulated many mutations, including exon deletions and frame shift mutations. So it no longer functions, it no longer produces anything. It's just junk. A similarly damaged non-functional gene is found in almost all monkeys and apes. Loss of endogenous vitamin C synthesis was due to the dietary substitution of vitamin C from fruit in the diets of ancient monkeys and apes. Over millions of years, this gene spontaneously degraded because of the presence of vitamin C from fruit. And the way this relaxed selection on the gene that would have produced it and allowed errors to accumulate without any negative effect. But when degeneration eventually became complete, our ancestors were then effectively dependent on fruit, addicted to fruit, so to speak, and were subject to selection to readapt other capacities from other genome and phenotype capacities to generate ascorbic acid intake to guarantee access to ascorbic acid. If the gene was not there, other means had to be, in a sense, evolved. One of these secondary adaptations for vitamin C acquisition was the de development of three color vision. It's unique to monkeys and apes compared to other mammals, for example. This enabled primates to detect the color change in fruit indicating ripeness, which probably initially evolved also for signaling in birds. Um, in other words, fruit distribution of the seeds uh, was probably initially a feature character carried out by birds. Uh, but as primates began to forage in the trees and began to eat fruit spontaneously, um, particularly in the old world shown here in the red group, um, three color vision developed. But it turns out that three, three color vision also developed by gene duplication. This occurred by a similar relaxation of selection process involving the duplication of the rhodopsin gene that's on the X chromosome in old world monkeys is shown here at the left. That allowed each duplicate cone pigment gene to limit its sensitivity to a smaller range of light frequencies. This is shown at the top right. The exact pattern of gene duplication that produced a long wave and red sensitive rhodopsin gene is now shown at the bottom with the green and yellow boxes indicating pigment genes that got duplicated. The red boxes here indicate back unrelated genes that just simply got copied along with the duplication. So to summarize, this ratchet-like process develops as a result of the prolongation of dependency. This prolongation could be the result of any of the conditions that promote temporary dependency for individuals or parts of individuals, molecules, um, organisms, or organisms and their environment become dependent on each other. But because taking advantage of extrinsic support relaxes selection on the now redundant and endogenous mechanism, the longer this condition persists without interruption, the higher the probability that there will be degeneration of the autonomous mechanism. Reacquiring a degraded functional capacity will often be more difficult than adapting to ensure access to the extrinsic resource. Because this results in more indirect, con indirect function, control will tend to be get redistributed across many independent mechanisms. The modified function will therefore become more complex, more fractionated, more flexible, and more resistant to disruption. It now involves many more sources of information. An analogous behavioral consequence of external redundant support may be responsible for the degeneration of genetic control of song production and its progressive offloading onto a social transmission in a domesticated bird, the Bengalese finch. This is work done by my friend and colleague, Kazuo Okonoya in Japan, uh, in Tokyo. Compared to its wild ancestor, the white rump munia, shown here on the far left, um, the Bengalese finch on the right, the Bengalese finch's song is more complex and more flexible. 
and this is shown by sonograms on the right. This change in singing behavior was not selectively bred. Coloration was how these animals were bred in captivity. But in about 250 years of selective breeding for color, sexual selection was replaced by human breeding. Now I should say that the story I'm gonna tell here is one that, that Professor Okanoya and I disagree about. And we have different takes on this same story, but I'm gonna tell you mine. By removing the stabilizing effects of sexual selection, that is birds selecting each other as mates by virtue of the song, constraints on song production were degraded to the point that song structure can be influenced by many other factors, including other neural systems. In other words, if um, singing was now redundant because breeding was being handled by breeders, human breeders, um, singing played no role and selection no longer could maintain the song of a specific bird. As a result, singing can be altered now by disturbing many different forebrain structures in the domestic finch that could not disturb song in the ancestor. No new forebrain structures or connections seem to have been modified by this domestication process. Though gene expression and neurotransmitter differences have been found that include both increased gene diversity and increased, increased expression of some neurotransmitters. Here again, the redundancy now has to do with the fact that song is redundant. Song doesn't play any role and therefore natural selection can allow it to degrade. But as control degrades in one part of the brain, this means that other aspects of the nervous system that have some effect on what you hear or what you produce or how you learn can now have an effect on song that it couldn't have when song was under strong selection. So here's the way I model this effect. Innate song production um, in both the wild and the domesticated finch develops through a subsong learning phase, that is during development, uh, after hatching, and finally as the animals reach puberty. Subsong is initially a crudely produced approximation to the typical adult song. The diagram here depicts that the song development algorithm is one in which there's a subsong that's produced. The bird listens to its own subsong, the crude song. It compares it to a kind of mental or auditory template. It listens to it, learns the difference, and then produces a subsequent slightly corrected version of the subsong. And this cycle repeats again and again recursively until the innate songs are ultimately acquired as they zero in uh, so that the, what they produce matches the inherited auditory template. And in this way, a highly innate song can be produced um, and passed on genetically. But what happens um, in the case of domestication? In the wild, a well-differentiated song plays a role in both sexual selection and species identification. And so there's selection to maintain its form. But in domestication, there is no effect of sexual selection to preserve song specificity. And the innate motor and auditory templates will therefore tend to degrade due to genetic drift. But as these intrinsic constraints degrade, auditory experience remembered from shortly after hatching now can become the primary source of auditory bias against which to compare subsong. So the same song differentiation algorithm now results in social transmission of the song. In other words, the song has been offloaded. In the wild, song structure was strongly constrained by transmission of genetic biases and learning was used to fine tune singing behavior to converge on the innate song. Domestication removed selection, maintaining these genetic biases. As a result, drift allowed these genes to accumulate mutations and to lose functional specificity. As genetic constraints weakened, constraints due to experience and developmental processes became more influential. This facilitated the offloading of control of song to social transmission and increased both song flexibility and the possibility of lineage-specific song dialects. 
Are there Finch domestication analogs that can be informative in the study of language evolution? Although human language is fundamentally different than birdsong with respect to its basis in symbolic as opposed to indexical reference, there are a number of parallels that can nevertheless be recognized, both in terms of behavior and anatomy in their evolution. First, both song, bird song, and language exhibit reduced arousal coupling of vocal behavior. So this is compared to vocalizations like laughter, sobbing, or shrieks of fright, which are highly emotional. Second, both are characterized by an equalization of phonological transition biases, enabling one song to one sound to follow another in almost random order. Third, both involve an increased role of auditory learning for vocalization. Fourth, both are characterized um, neurologically by a widely distributed synergistic organization of diverse forebrain structures as compared to the highly localized neural control of innate vocalizations. And we can see that depicted here on the right. Um, above innate vocalizations like laughter and sobbing, even in the human brain are controlled by just a few parts of the brain. But when it comes to language, it's distributed over all sorts of areas. And in fact, we're becoming aware of most of the cerebral cortex being involved one way or another in the production of language meaning uh, and so on. So could humans be a self-domesticated species? Could be, we be a sort of degenerate ape? Although this suggests that language may depend on loss of innate biases rather than the introduction of an innate language faculty, as some have suggested. These ideas are not mutually exclusive options. The genetic de-differentiation enabled by relaxed selection is not necessarily a cause of functional adaptation, but rather a source of highly biased combinatorial variations. This may have eventually come under the influence of selection to enhance the novel synergistic effects that's, that resulted. So in one sense, degradation produced increased complexity. The simple information processes that were innate now became offloaded to information processes that can be distributed across human groups. To address the relevance of this theory for understanding human evolution and the human future, we need to consider the consequence of the evolution of an externalized communication system, that is symbolic language. Symbolic communication provides powerful tools for social organization, discovering and sharing new technologies and for transferring and preserving knowledge. But because symbolic reference is conventional, it can only evolve within a continually interacting group. So this adaptation that has become essential for normal human development and survival is acquired from a source that is entirely external. Think again of the vitamin C example. This forces dependency on this external source with all the consequences that this produces, including degradation and codependency. It is as though we are obligate endosymbionts within culture. Evidence is accumulating that there has indeed been human genomic degradation, such as would be expected of a species that has become codependent on its larger symbiotic host. This figure depicts the 24 human chromosomes, including X and Y. The blue tick marks indicate the deletion of over 500 conserved non-coding regions of the genome. These are conserved regulatory regions, all of which are preserved in other species. It is as though a considerable aspect of human physiology has ceded control to a larger host on which human biology has become dependent. Could the degeneration of the human genome reflect the extent to which humans are obligate endosymbionts within culture? Could our plasticity, variability, and the shift of control of such important biological functions as reproduction to cultural regulation be an expression of a kind of human de-differentiation in comparison to other primates? Does this make us overly susceptible to manipulation by symbols and narratives? Is our increase in collective complexity 
acquired by individual degeneracy. But is this a handicap or an advantage for our human future? Higher order information, processes, information processing capacities can therefore emerge spontaneously, but they do so due to degeneracy of lower level information processes. And this degeneracy is caused by functional redundancy. This is a non-Darwinian process that is the inverse of a progressive improvement of adaptation. And yet it can give rise to unprecedented information processing capacities. Evolutionary complexification results from a tendency to simplify, to do less, to shift the burden elsewhere. It's an expression of life's least work principle. Life just backs into ever more intricate webs of dependency as it explores ways to avoid work. And this web of interdependency only becomes more entangled with time, like a kind of runaway bureaucracy. So can we learn from this new way of understanding the evolution of complexity, the evolution of more complex information processing systems? Can the duplication, degeneration, and complexity logic of evolution help us to better understand our current major transitions, the transitions that civilization now faces? Can it provide clues to how we might overcome the planetary level existential threats that human complexity has itself produced? Since group selection effects are not available at a planetary level and rational symbolic negotiations so far seem unable to overcome competing lower level conflicts between social groups. Perhaps this insight from evolution can be a help. Evolution demonstrates how hierarchic synergistic transitions can develop without top-down imposition of control or symbolically mediated predictions and collective agreement. The question is, can we discover an analogous strategy to the one evolution has used to produce higher order forms of information processing complexity? Can we facilitate a kind of global ratchet effect? With that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have will shift schedule by 15 minutes. So uh, we have some time uh, for questions. Uh, Terry, can I ask you to, uh, okay, uh, so I, uh, I would like to give opportunity to ask some questions. When you ask questions, please use this option reactions and then over there you have, when you uh, open this menu, you, you can uh, raise your hand and then I know that you want to ask questions. So uh, questions to Terry. Okay. Uh, not to waste time. If there are no questions, I have many. <laughs> so first thing is, uh, uh, in your lecture, I could see uh, that a very important role has something which we call redundancy, uh, duplication. Uh, on the other hand, we have from evolutionary, like traditional evolutionary point of view, we are talking about reproduction. Redundance, duplication has some kind of somewhat negative uh, connotation. Reproduction has positive uh, 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 connotation. Isn't it just from what you are saying, I understand these are basically parallel processes, just at different uh, levels. Well, would you agree with this? Yes and no. Obviously, um, redundancy of, for example, duplicated gene is not reproduction in the sense that we think about it in terms of animals. Um, reproduction does produce redundant animals um, and slightly variant animals so that there's uh, clearly an analogy between uh, reproduction uh, and redundancy. Um, the point of all of this is to say that, you know, when we look in information theory, redundancy seems to be an error correction trick. Um, here what we see is that that error correction trick is one that also makes possible 
the increase in uh, information entropy. Um, as errors can accumulate in the redundant components, um, this is actually an increase in information entropy. But that information entropy can now take on novel function. And so what I'm after here is a way to use information theory to talk about complexity and evolution. Okay, now, thanks for so it, it's like re reproduction. Reproduction is just a higher order version of a much more yeah. general feature in evolutionary biology. It, it okay. goes all the way down to molecular processes. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to give a uh, 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 microphone to Annette for her question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, dear Terry, for this really elaborated overview over the least effort principle in evolution and how complexity emerges from it. I have a um, question one level deeper connecting to the principle of stationary action in physics and the idea that uh, maybe, for example, epigenetic processes could be involved by this principle when you look, for example, at the uh, 1998 publication of Block et al. about force and velocity measured for the RNA polymerase. This was published in Science. Um, maybe there are some effects also on that level very down. What do you think? I actually don't know what to think about it. Um, okay. uh, clearly, these are principles that have something to do with physical principles as well. So I think the analogy is probably well taken. Um, I just I just can't off the top of my head think how they fit together. Um, it sounds like you already have thought how it might go together. I would be happy to to hear that argument because I do think that these are fairly general principles, and I think in part they're general principles because they're information principles, yes. and we should yeah. expect this to be a in a sense a way to incorporate these information principles both into physical processes and into living processes. But I agree. I'm afraid I can't follow, follow the argument. Okay, thank you, Gordana. Uh, thank you very much, Terry, for a very fascinating talk. I would like to, to see if you see any connections between your thinking and the extended evolutionary hypothesis. Um, this is clearly an extended evolutionary hypothesis. Is different than those that are out there, however. Um, many of them are using you know, what you call multi-level selection, talking about natural selection happening at many levels. Um, this is a process that actually produces those levels. So it's, in a sense, prior to the evolutionary synthesis that, that people talk about. On the other hand, um, it's very much an extension of Darwin directly in the following sense. Going back to his ninth his 1838 notebook, he had sort of three principles. He said the first principle was that grandchildren are like grandparents. The second principle is um, that there is variation in reproduction and offspring um, do vary from one another. And the third one is that there's you know, more offspring produced than can survive. Uh, and I've caricatured it, those are not exactly his words, but um, the, the principle that I'm talking about now is a principle of producing extra. So built into Darwin's thinking was the production of something extra. So the very basic general idea of Darwinian evolution has to do with production of redundancy. And this is where uh, Marson's question about reproduction, I think, is relevant. Uh, what we see here is that, in fact, um, that reproduction or production of extra stuff is necessary. Once you have the production of extra stuff, once there's the production of um, redundancy, um, there's now the, the possibility of playing. Once you've, in a sense, got error correction, you can now play around with that. And I think it's, yeah, I, I like to use this, this, old, this old statement, you know, all work and no play makes, dull, makes Jack a dull boy, <laughs> it's a statement. Um, what I would say about evolution, is that all selection and no play um, uh, makes evolution kind of a dull process. Uh, this is a process of play. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Thanks very much. 
I'm going to try to relate what I understood in that very interesting talk to some ideas that uh, I developed with um, a lot of help. In fact, she did most work with Jackie Chappell, who's a biologist in uh, the University of Birmingham, where I am. Um, she uh, works on, mainly on primates and, and birds. But <clears throat> uh, I had noticed things about the ways in which um, humans seem not to have things specified at various stages, but they collected information which was used to specify something at a later stage when some genetic mechanism picked kicked in and we call this a meta configured genome and the most striking example is linguistic development mm -hmm. where uh, the different levels at which language works are not all learned independently but uh, a higher level might kick in at a later stage and say what have we got now and what can we do with it and the this if this happens at various levels then the um things that happen earlier might be influenced by the environment in a way that the later levels can then take advantage of when they are instantiated. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. So it's very similar to arguments about pedomorphism. That is, the, the humans, um, by being born in a more immature stage, um, are more strongly influenced by their environment. Their brains are structured more effectively by their immediate environment than species yeah. that are born in a more mature state. Right, and, that, and what like this means, yeah. sorry? Is that sort of like where you're going with this? Yeah, it's related. Uh, I think the details are, are quite complicated and there'll be different examples, for instance, in linguistic development and other kinds. But one of the consequences is that it can allow very rapid social evolution because things that uh, would normally have to be specified in the genome at an early stage instead are left partly unspecified and then they're influenced by what happened in the earlier generations to change the environment which lets something come in then a later stage of gene expression takes advantage of that and says oh what have we got here and the most striking and obvious example of that is linguistic development but there are all sorts of other things, like all the different ways that kids now communicate with devices that none of our ancestors knew anything about. And uh, uh, there'll be many different examples in the development of mathematics and science and so on, which I think depend on that. So I, I, that's, that's where I'm going with this argument. Uh, obviously, I, I came myself from a background of neurology and linguistics. Uh, so this is sort of a precursor to that kind of an argument. And I do indeed think that one of the things that's happened in our species is that we've become more and more addicted, so to speak, on this sort of social linguistic symbolic environment uh, to develop our brains. Our brains don't develop normally uh, in the absence of that kind of environment. But this also means that there's a kind of offloading and externalization. A lot of what was handled uh, genetically, innately, has been offloaded onto the social group has been offloaded onto information that you've been talking about, symbolic information that can be passed uh, from generation to generation. We are obligate symbionts in that respect. We can't live normally without being embedded in this larger social group. Um, we have degraded in some respects, become more flexible, more plastic, but that's also an advantage because as you say, the more we offload these processes, uh, the more we can take advantage of all of those extra affordances that are out there that we can invent in one generation and pass on to the next generation and so on. Uh, so clearly this is the advantage of uh, all these ways we have of passing on information. I think of writing as a classic example of this. There's this famous story, of course, that Plato tells where in the Phaedo where he says that writing is going to degrade the memories of people uh, because they'll rely on the written word uh, yes, that was true. I, you know, I, I still don't remember all the phone numbers I used to know that are now on my electronic devices uh, that I can rely on. But in so doing, I have gained so much more capacity, the information processing capacity I now have, 
because I'm in, in a sense a symbiont uh, reliant on this external source, uh, whether it's writing or whether it's past education or whether it's now some electronic device or going to Google for information that I don't know. Um, all of this has made me much more uh, informationally complex. But it does depend on the more abstract, evolved, high level capabilities that can look around and see what apparatus have I got to instantiate myself with at a later I, stage yeah, of development. Yeah, That's right. If, if you're addicted to something on the outside, if you need this stuff, you've, you've also got to have this tendency to want to find it. Right. To want to and, that and that requires an extra level of sophistication in, in what's in the genome. Uh, but at a higher level of abstraction. So what I'm actually suggesting is just the opposite. I think it uh, requires I you know, sense, <laughs> degeneration, degradation, so that because I don't have that capacity innately, um, I have to have the capacity to look for it outside. Well, the, this would probably take a long time, but uh, I'd, I'd just say that the higher level linguistic competences have a kind of abstraction that can be instantiated in many different ways, but they'll have to be there in the genome to be available to be used, whether it's in a sign language or in Swahili or, or uh, uh, French or Urdu or whatever. And, and so in that sense, an extra level of complication at a high level of abstraction has to be ready to take advantage of what the lower levels have produced by absorbing stuff from the environment. Okay, thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I have to uh, break this uh, discussion because we have to move on.